Hello, welcome to Micro Segmentation Masterpieces. I'm your host, Matthew Glenn. Join us as we begin our adventures into Demoland. We'll enter a world of timeless tales and fantasy where we reveal why micro segmentation with Illumio is the masterpiece you've been looking for. Let us begin with a cautionary tale of man versus monster, wherein curiosity leads to the creation of a new form of life made of very old parts. Hideous, terrifying, alive. He is known by all as Frankenstein, the infamous monster who sets out to terrorize his creator. An ill-fated story born of a natural complexity. This is a cautionary tale of man versus technology, where ugly, cobbled together solutions can terrorize an administrator forever. Micro segmentation is no place for a mad scientist. We will now show you how organizations can avoid Frankensteinian solutions. Wow, um, that was an amazing introduction. Thank you, thank you, Matt. So in all reality, um, we don't want admins to be terrorized by microsegmentation, right? So we're gonna get into that story right now. Um, for uh, me here, I am Neil Patel. I'm a senior technical marketing engineer at Illumio. Um, I'm joined by my main man, Harish over here. He's gonna be doing my demo DJ. What's going on, Harish? Hello everyone, I'm Harish Chakravarti, Senior uh, Technical Marketing Engineer here at Illumio. I'll be your demo DJ today. We have an awesome presentation with a live demo. Stay tuned. Uh, we are also taking questions on Twitter. Feel free to tweet us at techfieldday22, TFE22, hashtag. Over to you, Neil. Thank you, thank you. So let's get right into this, right? What do we mean by terrorizing our admins and those Frankensinian solutions, right? So it all starts with admin access to resources. Um, when you do segmentation, you are in a world of zero trust. And zero trust really means bare minimal or zero access. You want the absolute bare necessities communicating. So that really leaves your admins out in the cold. How do you know who needs access when? Where do they need access from? So there's all of these inherent challenges that now are introduced. So what we really do to get around this is, you know, there's a bunch of solutions. Um, first, we obviously have user credentials to access these systems, username, passwords, whether they're privileged credentials, standard credentials, um, and they really become the last line of defense for these admins. Um, those credentials are the only option for getting into those systems. And when those credentials are compromised, you have a big problem at play. So what we do is, you know, we build things like jump hosts, VDI infrastructures, bastions, all of these things to try to control ac access into our environments. And in all honesty, it's hard, it's complicated, and it's just expensive. Um, think about how much it would cost to actually go out and deploy a full VDI infrastructure for all of your resources or a full jump host infrastructure for all of your resources. So what we really need and what you really should be looking for is a low cost, low friction solution, something that is super, super straightforward. So what are today's solutions? I kind of mentioned them at first. I'll go one step deeper uh, really, really quickly. It's really jump post in BDI. Now these diagrams are simplified just for the sake of, uh, for demonstrating it, but Really what you got is jump hosts in which you have servers uh, inside data center, uh, be it AWS, be it physically, and you've got a bunch of jump hosts that have IB connectivity. The other side of things is VDI. This is a little bit more polished, but that polish comes with a lot more complexity. If you've ever tried to deploy Citrix VDI, VMware Horizon, remote desktop services, intensely complicated. It's doable, but it's very complicated. It gives you some flexibility options like customizing each user space, 
but again, extra layers of complexity just to grant your admins access into these systems. And not only is the complexity there, it's super, super expensive, right? It's not cheap to license all this stuff. It's not cheap to deploy all this stuff. And it costs compute, whether you deploy it here, whether you deploy it in the cloud, all of that is an expense. So that's really what we mean by Frankenstein solutions. You put a bunch of pieces together trying to accomplish the goal you had at hand. So what do we do about it? What does Illumio do to solve this problem? And it's really what we call machine authentication or admin connect. Um, what you're looking at here is a very simple diagram and I'll explain it a little bit more in detail. Um, you've got two endpoints, both with the same user logged in, right? So that's your first line of defense, that username and password. Now, natively, without any type of control, both endpoints will be able to connect into your database or your server or whatever critical asset you have. However, with Illumio, and machine authentication, what you can do is you have a native second layer of authentication, a native multi-factor mechanism in the form of PKI and certs. So now you can match the certificate on the endpoint and the host itself to the certificate lives on the server, creating a secure connection, creating a secure bridge. So what that means now is not only from a operational perspective, have you removed all of the complexity of jump hosts, um, you've also eliminated some of that risk, right? You're now using your native fingerprint to authorize the user. And that means not only does somebody have to steal a credential, but they have to steal a laptop as well, or a computer as well, or a physical asset as well to get into that critical system. So that's enough of the presentation and the showing you um, in Slideware. We're gonna actually go right into the demonstration here and Harish is gonna help me out. He's gonna be my demo DJ and we're gonna show you secure system access right here. So Neil, it just occurred to me that uh, we haven't given a quick product overview yet. Yeah. Let's go ahead and give a quick product overview, uh, not spend too much time on it and quickly dive into the demo. Sounds sure. good? Sure, that's awesome. All right, so what you see here is we've logged into the policy compute engine. This is the orange box Matt Glenn was referring to earlier on in the presentation. Once you log in, you're going to see your Google Earth view of all your data centers, including your compute instances in the public cloud. So here we have two data centers, one in California, one in New York, and you have a data center uh, in public cloud AWS. So if you drill a little deeper into the California data center, you can see all the applications inside the California data center. You can see all the different applications right here. Uh, for example, you can see the ordering application that is in the development environment right in the California data center, IoT devices, development, California data center. Real quick, what you're going to see is you're going to see the traffic flows between applications. Uh, let's say if I were to just zoom into the ordering application, let me zoom in a little bit here you're gonna see both green lines and red lines. So these traffic flows are green if there is a policy in place that allows the traffic and it is red if there isn't a policy in place. Um, you know, I'm gonna pause here for a second, you know, um, uh, you know, let me make sure that since we have audience across different spectrums watching the live presentation and perhaps even the archive one at a later time, let's make sure that it is inclusive and it works across. So what I'm gonna do is real quick, I'm gonna click on my profile here and switch over to the color deficiency mode right here. Go ahead and save it. And let's switch back to the illumination here again. So what this does is it changes the colors. So it helps across uh, people with different kind of uh, color deficiencies, all right? So I'm gonna zoom back in into the same traffic workflows here. And now you see the color changes a little bit, uh, which helps people with uh, different visibilities. All right, so you can see the traffic flows right here. So now if I zoom in further into the ordering application, you can see the workloads which are labeled as web, database processing. This ordering application currently has nine workloads. It's currently enforced in visibility mode. Uh, you can, from here, go to uh, selective enforcement or fully enforce all the workloads. Uh, there are four different connected applications here. 
We have core services into talking into the application. We have another ordering application, the New York data center talking to it. And then we have an IoT. Let me switch back here. Um, I wanna quickly get into the app group map here. Uh, what app group map does is it groups all the workloads by application and environment irrespective of the location. So when you have multiple data centers where your application resides, it groups them all together so your team members can collaborate and work together. We have a demo coming up as well. From here, what you could do is you can go to the policy generator uh, and write policies. In fact, we recommend policies for you either at an app group level or you can drill into role level or get into specific services. We also have an explorer view right here which offers the same information in a tabular format. We also have integration with different SIM tools, which includes IBM's QRadar and Splunk. Uh, let me go ahead here and change the time frame. So uh, actually a quick question while I change the time frame. the app groups, are those manually generated or is there a way for it to be automatically discovered? It's automatically discovered. So here, if I click on the navigation menu and go to app groups and I list them, it automatically lists the app groups. So the app groups are generated based on the labels associated with the workloads. And then what you could do is if I click on edit app group type, you can actually group them either by application environment, like the one I have, or you can have them by application environment or location, depending on your business needs. And, and so it, it basically, it knows a various application, those tags that you just mentioned. Those kind of come from the kinds of traffic that it's seeing, or is it like the processes running on the host? Kind of how how does it understand that? Like, that's a fantastic question. So, what you're referring to here are the labels, right? Uh, for example, the labels like web database processing, or even ordering production California, right? These are labels which are associated with the workload. Am I am I understanding your question right? Right, but. So that label, is that something that an administrator has to go in and assign? Or does the, uh, does the agents go in and say, hey, that's running Apache. That's probably a web server. That, it, it, how, does, how does that go? How does that function? So right now, the way it works is uh, when you bring up a new workload, right? As a part of bringing up a new workload, you can pair a workload to the policy compute engine. As a part of pairing, you can have a pairing profile that has predefined labels. So if you know you're bringing up your web workloads or your processing workloads, the right set of labels get associated with it, right? That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is you can also associate the right set of labels uh, by actually getting into the PC and changing the labels. Also, what we have uh, seen- Can I add something there? You can also look at like if it's HTTPD and that was the most traffic process on a system, uh, you can use that as a way to label it. Um, just because like if you if you think about um, something that's running um, uh, running like you know MySQL and HTTP, you may go, well, hold on, it's running web and it's running a database. Uh, uh, you know you, that may not just labeling it web may not be the right thing. You can set um, uh, you, so you, a lot of what a lot of customers do is they look at the most traffic port that's not a core service and use that to drive the labeling of those systems. And the uh, the workloads themselves are manually defined by the admins, and then that's when they have the opportunity to tag them. That's correct, and and it's okay. important to note that a lot of the time when we arrive at a customer, Scott, the uh, like we'll get CMDB data, and it's fundamentally always wrong. And and the fact of micro segmentation is that when you look at any of the products in the space, we're all using tags and labels for policy generation, and everyone's tags and labels are wrong. So when you hear the third vignette that we're gonna, uh, third story we're gonna tell you today, you're gonna learn about how we enable not just a centralized team to do it, but actually to bring the organization along on a journey. So a lot of this will help, uh, will, help uh, will be unveiled to you as the stories uh, go on today. All right, uh, moving along here. Uh, Neil, let's get back to the demo here, thank you. Yeah. So let's go back here to the rule sets. Let's pull up the segmentation rule set here. And let's pull up the rule set we have for Perfect. That. Go ahead, Neil. Perfect, perfect. So um, kind of circling us back to the situation. Thank you, Reese. That was an awesome demo. Um, we are talking about administrator access into 
critical systems like databases, right? So if you think about it again, from the Frankensteinian, from the, the old way, jump boxes, VDI, all of that, what we can actually do with Illumio is augment segmentation with just actual policy and rules that permit access. So if you look at this rule right here, it says admin endpoints. So that label um, for all devices that are labeled as admin endpoints can connect into the database on 3306, so a standard MySQL. However, there is a little indicator up top that says machine authentication on. So what this means is the machines will only be able to connect in if they have the proper certificate and authentication to ID themselves to the server. So this is very important because, especially in today's world when you have administrators and their endpoints, which are you know, moving around their laptops or their desktops, or maybe they have a dynamic IP address, you can't just grant access individually based on IPs and keep paying holes. That's not gonna work. So this actually lets you leverage the identification of the machine itself, agnostic of where it may be. And the power of using these labels is the labels grow and contract with your environment, right? If you have 10 admins today, five tomorrow, 15 the day after, all of that just scales without having to adjust and modify the policy. So this is it, a very simple, a very singular rule that grants access based on the machine authentication, right? So in theory, that's great. We authenticate based on a cert and we have that machine up. What Harish is actually gonna pull up now is, let's do it in the real world. So he's got two endpoints here, endpoint one and endpoint two. And what I want you to call out is, let's make sure that we have a clean slate, right? If you look at endpoint one here, you see that the user logged in is TFE user and they're connected to endpoint one. And in the second machine over there, you see the user is again, TFD user, and they're logged into endpoint two. Same user, different computer, right? So this is how we're gonna be able to show you the actual access into that database. So if we pull up MySQL Explorer, for the purpose of this, it's a little easier to see with the GUI, what you're gonna notice is both systems are trying to connect in to the same MySQL DB. You can see here, CRM, and here CRM as well. Harish has go ahead and tried to connect onto workload two and it's still waiting. Whereas workload one, we're able to connect in just like that, boom, no problem at all. So what you're seeing here very simply is the reality of a user and a computer being able to connect. That's a necessity. Over there on endpoint two, you see the error popped up. This is unable to connect to the workload. And that's because the user is valid but the computer is not. That endpoint is not authorized because they do not have the right certificate. They are not authenticated to connect it into that database. So, so Neil, was, sorry to yeah, go ahead. jump in there, but what are you using to manage the PKI infrastructure? Um, so you can use really anything to manage the PKI infrastructure. You use your own environment. You can use your GPOs, your Active Directory. Um, the way we do it in Illumio is you identify and tell us about the CA. Um, and then based on that, we'll identify any endpoints that have been authorized with a certificate from that CA. Uh, also, uh, like if something joint, if it's on a Windows system and it's domain joined, that uh, when something becomes domain joined, your domain controller will provision a certificate on that system and that certificate's what used also. So like your Windows estate is pretty much um, taken care of from the moment you start. Great question. That's wonderful. So uh, Harish, let's bring us back to the, uh, to the closing here. And what I wanted to get at is, you know, you saw how easy it was from a rule set perspective. It was just one line that said endpoints to the admin, um, to the database, authentication on, right? So what we're doing really is we're taking care of our admins and our frontline workers first. This is the most important thing because these are the people that are gonna be maintaining the application, they've been working in the application, and we're able to do it super, super simply, right? We have no extra deployments, no extra software. We just augment the segmentation that's already in place. And it helps us solve some of that risk and receive or get to that ROI quicker, right? Passwords are just that, passwords. They're stealable, they are you know, hackable if someone makes it really unsecure. However it is, 
if you take a password and you use it somewhere else, boom, you're in. But here you have that second layer of native multi-factor authentication, right? And at the end of the day, what this means is you're able to get your admins access in a world of zero trust, right? Think about that. You have a zero trust policy that is super tight and only permitting exactly what's necessary. And with Admin Connect, with machine authentication, you're really authorizing admins to get in and maintaining and keeping that zero trust in place. And you know what? On top of all of that, you did it zero cost, no additional infrastructure, right? All as a part of Lumio, all as a part of your segmentation process. Well, I'm seeing all good auto provisioning for the Windows side, which is to be expected because we're in Active Directory environments. Would that AD join extend to Mac OS or Linux clients that can be capable of doing that? Or is there still some, a few manual steps? So there may be possible, Matt might've seen this in the, in the real world. So, uh, so it, let's imagine that your sysadmin wants to talk port 22 on a uh, Linux system. So long as the CA from uh, your domain controller, which will be, is a valid CA in the root CA in the root store of that Linux system, it will work. Um, from an outbound control perspective, if your sysadmin is running a Mac OS, that is not yet supported. Um, one question about your licensing model. You said you, there's no additional cost so far. Um, I doubt you're going to do it for free. So how do you base the licensing on endpoints, on users, on throughput? Could you elaborate? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I'll give you a short answer, Matt, we'll have some more detail, but it's really just down to the number of protected workloads. Um, per workload, a single cost, that's it. 